All right, well, thank you everyone for taking time out of your schedules. And if you're calling in from BC, it's a beautiful day outside, so I really appreciate it. It's our first weekend of summer, it seems. Uh, I'd like to start this call um, by also acknowledging that I'm speaking in, uh, from Vancouver on the ancestral territories of the Coast Salish speaking peoples. And I hope everyone can um, acknowledge uh, to themselves uh, their own territories they're speaking from. Uh, during this call, we have a counselor on hand. If anyone um, is experiencing any, any need to talk, we can set up a breakout room for you. Uh, just send me a notification in the chat or send Heidi um, a notification in the chat, and then I'll arrange to create a breakout room. Uh, and I'll do my best to do that even while I'm sharing my screen. Uh, just be patient and we can get that set up for you. It's probably best to just go straight to Heidi um, as well. And you can do that as a personal chat. You don't have to tell everybody in the room. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Wendy. Um, and if you have any other questions, just put them in the chat uh, and we'll get back to you as quick as we can. Uh, so today's program will be, uh, we'll start with a quick summary of um, our healing supports. And then I'll spend about 20 minutes talking in detail about our three pillars of healing supports. And then I'll pass uh, the torch over to Dr. Nicholas Harrison, our guest speaker of today, um, who will be speaking on um, the perspective, uh, trauma from the perspective of a child. After that, we're gonna have an open discussion with Dr. Harrison between the members of the project office before we end the recording and open up the chat to any members who are present today. Um, I was reviewing some documents, um, old documents in preparation for this meeting and I came across this quote from Dr. Satsuki Ina who gave a presentation in 2017. And I thought it was very powerful, so I included it here where she said, secrecy is the poison of healing. And that really spoke to me um, in reference to a lot of the conversations I've had with members of the community over the work of our healing funds. Everyone in the chat has a link to this presentation and we included this slide um, to be your one stop for all the, all the most relevant information you might need for this um, for this information session. Uh, there are two links to our website. Um, our URL is a little cumbersome and long, uh, but I, it gets our details across. Uh, there's also a bit.ly link if you want to share it with anyone that's a little easier to transfer. The bit.ly link is case sensitive, so make sure you capitalize the H and the A if you send that. Uh, the Healing Fund project period is uh, it started last September and it's open until September 2026. Uh, so this is a five year program um, that we're running for the time being. In the chat, there's a link to a community feedback form. If uh, the healing supports aren't, if you don't think they're enough or if you would like to see them continued, uh, we would like to hear from you in that community feedback form. For counseling support, uh, we're offering uh, to pay for counseling sessions for any members of surviving families, and we'll be able to cover up to $200 per session. Our education grants are, are open now, and we'll be closing the application period three times per year, and that's up to $10,000 per award. Um, and the awards are retroactive to June 15th, 2015. And that was the date the apology was delivered by the Anglican Church of Canada um, to commit to healing supports. After that apology happened, we had a series of uh, community information meetings across um, Canada. Wendy and Judy visited eight communities and um, they, they canvassed the Japanese Canadian communities to see what they, how they would like to see a meaningful follow up from the Anglican Church of Canada. And that formed the basis for negotiations with the Anglican Church representatives and forms the basis of our healing fund today. 
In 2020, we joined with the National Association of Japanese Canadians. Many of you will remember we used to be called the uh, Japanese Canadian Working Group. Um, so when we joined the NAJC, we've had a couple of name changes, and now we're known as um, the Project Office for the Healing Funds. Uh, and in 2022, our supports officially opened. One question I've been getting from community members is about exactly who's eligible for our healing supports. Uh, for many decades, um, Mr. Nakayama, uh, you know, abused hundreds of children and those children went on uh, to grow up, um, to have their own relationships, to have their own families and their families had, you know, grandchildren were born. Um, in an area of uh, counseling that's come to light is known as intergenerational trauma or generational trauma. And it's how a, how when a person experiences a traumatic event during their life, it can affect their ability to form meaningful relationships with others, uh, especially with their family members, um, intimate partners and their descendants. And in that way, the abuse, um, the abuse suffered by one generation propagates and secondary and tertiary effects down the generations. And this was an aspect that survivors and community members back in 2017 and 2018 really felt passionately about uh, to address this cycle of trauma and the cycle of pain um, that circulates within the community to this day because of what happened in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and so on. So we define a survivor as anyone who is sexually abused by the former Anglican priest, Gordon Goichi Nakayama. And the definition of a survivor family member has um, any family members uh, associated with a survivor. Um, the definition includes, but it's not limited to, siblings of survivors and their descendants. So this is um, a link to, or a screenshot from our website on what you'll be looking for if you're interested or needing to access any healing supports that we're offering. Um, more more information is being put on the website every week. I try to keep it as up to date as possible. Um, I'll be including under the counseling support link, some resources for people in, in their respective provinces um, on how to access counseling support or how to start looking for counseling support, because I know how difficult it can be if you're, if you're not accustomed, um, uh, you know, to asking for help or to reaching out for help, you might not know where to look. And it, it's you know, one thing to offer support, but it's another to, you know, help lead you through the process. And that's what we're here uh, trying to do at the project office. So if, you, if there are any questions, feel free to ask us. Um, conversely, I've tried, or we've tried to make the website as open and accessible as possible because we know even asking for help or reaching out via email or telephone can be difficult for a lot of people. Our counseling support, um, community healing initiatives and education grant support, all those are by application and the applications will be reviewed on a rolling basis by the Healing Fund Project Office. All the information contained therein, all personal identifiers is confidential to the Project Office. That information will not be shared um, with either the National Association of Japanese Canadians or the Anglican Church of Canada. They'll only be getting statistical information. We know that applying could be difficult because we do ask for personal histories or familial histories with the abuse. And for that reason, we have um, a counselor on retainer to help anybody who, who needs help um, with their application form. Someone to talk to, someone to, um, yeah, just lead them through the process. Again, it's not an easy topic to talk about. And again, I want to express my gratitude for everyone who made it to the call because it's, 
it, it can be difficult. And I, I guess I'll leave it for Dr. Harrison to speak more about that a little bit later. Uh, so counseling support um, is available. Uh, we will pre-approve six sessions at a time per person, and that's renewable. And there's no limit placed on counseling support. Education grants, uh, the award is available to anyone who's currently undertaking studies or has undertaken studies from the date of the apology uh, onward. Uh, education grants are not specific to university students. They're open to vocational studies, um, college, uh, training programs, any sort of post-secondary um, after the age of 18 um, training. The reason why we're offering education grants is because that was one of the main um, requests by the community uh, back in those community information meetings. We heard from a lot of people who said that, you know, it's too late for me. But if there's any healing that's going to happen, I want it to go to my, um, my family and the family of my friends. We're offering education grants because it's um, I mean, it had widespread support from the Anglican Church, the community, and um, the Japanese Canadian Working Group. Uh, but also because there's a strong financial impact that families face when a member of their family, often um, the breadwinner, being a male in the 1950s and 60s, uh, is suffering through uh, trauma and abuse. And that has major financial impacts because it can affect their ability to, for example, their relationship with authority, with their boss, or even their ability to go into work because we all know that healing has to be taken, um, has to be taken day by day. Uh, the last one I'll speak about is in the middle, community healing initiatives. Uh, we're offering our services um, to help any members of any community across Canada with um, either a direct or indirect relationship with the uh, with Mr. Nakayama's abuse uh, to offer healing supports, community education workshops, um, writing books, uh, publishing materials, um, anything that will help the community in their healing efforts. And even if you weren't uh, a direct survivor, the community is reeling from this abuse because um, because of the number of people affected, the close-knit nature of the Japanese Canadian community, and of course the compounding effects of internment, plus the abuse, plus dispersal across Canada. All of those multi-layered factors are interwoven and our healing support, um, well, it was, people requested uh, community healing support. And that was one of the focuses of our um, meeting last year with Dr. Satsuki Ina, who very poignantly said that um, community abuse requires community healing. And that's one of the things that they focused on. Um, well, she worked on a project in um, San Francisco with community trauma, and they had a large focus on community bonding and community healing efforts. Um, and with that, I would like to pass um, the conversation over to our guest speaker, Dr. Harrison. Uh, Dr. Harrison is an acclaimed author, actor, stunt coordinator, researcher, and Jedi, his words. <laughs> uh, his many accomplishments are matched by his welcoming and warm reception to conversation about this difficult topic. Um, Dr. Harrison has offered to speak about his experience with abuse and his lifelong act um, or yeah, discussion with healing. Um, he wrote about this in his book, Safe Space, uh, a true story of faith betrayal and the power of the force, um, which he will explain more about. Um, so Dr. Harrison. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for being here. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone who will watch the link later for coming to the link. Um, I was saying earlier that even one person to be here today 
is fantastic. So thanks to everyone who has taken time in their day to come here and to listen to a stranger talk about abuse uh, on a sunny day, which is always a difficult subject to talk about. And I just want to establish a few things uh, before I do get into it. One of them is um, I was abused uh, as a child from kindergarten through grade four was when I spent the ordeal of, of my abuse. And abuse, suffering through abuse, surviving abuse, um, living through it. I just want to preface it that as I talk, uh, you might notice that I might have tears and it's fine. They just come sometimes and it's okay. And I'm okay. I talk about this a lot. So sometimes I get emotional when I speak about it because it's still very raw, even years after the event happened. And I'm sure uh, as many survivors will attest to those things that happen in our formative years can carry on and can continue to perpetuate unless we continue to understand the why it happened and try to take the blame away from ourselves. Um, just a few weeks ago, I was in Disneyland and there's a place walking towards the main gates that has a particular smell. And I have to warn people that I go into Disneyland with that I might start crying just for a few minutes because as the smell um, hits my, my senses, it brings me right back to that first time of going there. And the reason that's a, uh, a waypoint in my life is because that was the first time I found a place that was what I considered very safe as a child, a place dedicated to children and happiness. And that's shortly after I had been released from the private school where I was abused. So. I find the healing cycle is not a linear cycle. It's circular. We make advances, we retreat. We make a little bit more, we come back and around. Things circle back and that's, that's okay. And everybody has a different uh, way of healing. Some people uh, keep it in all their lives. Other people like me want to talk about it because it's an injustice to the child. And I feel a responsibility to the younger me who was unable to speak up. So with that being said, I'll tell you a little bit about my story of abuse. So I came from a working class family in the North. My dad was a welder, my mom was a banker, and they decided they wanted to put me into a school for a better education. So they enrolled me in a private Catholic school. While I was there, because my parents were not Catholic, um, I became a target of fascination with the priests, uh, two main abusers that I had that uh, paid a lot of attention to me. Now, my, my dad was always on shutdowns, so he'd always be out of town working. So for a lot of the time, it was almost like having a single mom. And they made me feel special. They made me feel uh, that I really belonged in this environment, that uh, I, was, I had so much to offer. And that's how the grooming started by gaining my confidence as a child. Then it became little secret games. One of them was um, you had to go and visit this one priest by the rectory and tell him that you had a secret. And he would ask you what the secret was. And you would say that you wanted candy. That was the secret. Then he would present you with candy. It was a way to see which children would come to them. And of course, what child doesn't love candy? So it was, it was a thing that was done. And then the rewards got bigger and then the destination became more private and more out of eyesight or out of the way of the common areas. Uh, one of the other priests uh, would make children who wanted candy reach into his pockets to find it. And so there was always something weird about it. Um, and something that never felt quite good. But there was a sense of like, oh, you know, you're a special child. You're um, amazing. You are all these wonderful things. And they take on this role of almost a father figure to you. And when your dad is away, is not near you, or your family is split up, it becomes something that children look towards. It's something that we imprint ourselves as children upon people in authoritative positions like that, and especially with priests. Uh, eventually, what happened um, became more 
overt. Uh, and it started with uh, being fitted for cassocks and being fondled, not understanding what it was because as a child, you don't have that sexualized nature. You're still developing, you're still trying to be a child, but you know something is not right. And they always preface it with, there's a secret. This is our secret. This is just between you and me. Don't tell anyone. When my abuse escalated further to touching, to groping, uh, being forced to perform sexual acts, being beaten, um, it was done in a way that I was told that God was purifying me or that I was a dirty child and that I needed to earn God's love and that these acts became more violent, more uh, emotionally manipulative. <clears throat> and it got to the point where I was told that my burden was that I had to be quiet because they were doing this so I could earn, earn God's love. And if I was to tell anyone what happened to me, that God would destroy my family and myself. Now, as a five-year-old or six-year-old, being told that you are responsible for the survival of your family is something that a child takes very, very seriously. And I have been told by other people as an adult, the, the common question that comes out is, well, why didn't you say something? It's not that easy. Remember, these are children who, when you tell them Santa's coming, they believe Santa's coming. Children are willing to suspend their disbelief. They will believe. They believe in magic. They believe in what you tell them. But when you start using religion as a construct to control and to manipulate, not just children, it can be people that are in emotionally... Um, demanding situations people that have gone through trauma it could be people who have gone through incarceration and so they are not strong their strength has been diminished because things have been taken away from them and then you add to that this pressure of god and an organized religion and it just mounts and becomes so much more and that becomes something huge because as a, as a child i was not catholic by my family I was a non-Catholic who came to a Catholic school, which was one of the reasons I think initially I was targeted. And learning as a child, you know, it's, it's amazing with religion, uh, especially the Catholic religion, um, how we are to fear God. And then we're told the one thing, he's all loving, he's all, he's everywhere. And then we're told also by the priests who are direct vessels to God that we cannot say anything because God will kill us. And we learn about the Old Testament and just how vengeful God can be. So we take this all in. And as a child then, what happened is my childhood became very stoic. I had to spend a lot of time by myself because I was being picked on and, and abused and raped and sexually uh, fondled and emotionally um, manipulated. I became an outcast with the other children. And I lost my boundaries. I had any boundaries that were, would normally form during your childhood, those years, I didn't have them. So I became a target for other children to beat me up because I was different, because I was soiled, because I was unworthy of love, because I was not deserving of living. These are the things that had been told to me that I had to work hard to earn God's love. It was horrific. And I carry this on. This happened from, it started in kindergarten with the straps, which then led to the canings, which led to the sexual uh, acts of, you name it, it happened. Um, and I was always told by the priests that if I told anyone that God would destroy my family. And it was in grade four where a lay teacher at the school someone who was not uh, a nun or a priest, her method of discipline was to whip the children who were late into class or the last few in the class with her electrical cord, which had a Bakelite plug on it. And often because I would, I started eating 
overeating as a child uh, to try to make myself unattractive to the priests. It was a subconscious thing, but I felt that if I was ugly or didn't raise my head, I wouldn't get picked. Um, however, in that school, in that class, I was always bumped to the back of the line. And this one particular day, uh, the, the teacher ended up whipping me 14 or 15 times. And the ends and, and that day, this is in the 70s. So if you can remember what the electrical kettle cords look like back then, they had this huge bake-like, bake-light plug that was very big. Uh, so I had welts all over my arms and legs. And that Saturday, um, or Sunday, it was a Sunday. Uh, I was at home, my, my dad was on a shutdown at another mill up in Terrace, I think. And there was a Chinook, so it was warm. It was like early spring, it was quite warm. And my mom asked me to put on short sleeves and shorts to help her with the laundry outside. And I told, I had a bunch of excuses why I couldn't wear my shorts and, and long sleeves. And those of you who had, um, strong mothers know that mothers get their wish so she demanded that I go change into shorts and a, and a short sleeve shirt and while I was in this uh, my bedroom having a, a breakdown because I know she was going to see these welts I didn't know because she was going to ask me about it I went back out and she saw them and immediately the mother's instinct came back and she said, what happened? And I tried to tell her that I had fallen down some stairs and I had all these things that happened. She didn't believe me. And then it dawned on me in my child's mind that the teacher who did this to me was not a priest or a nun. And none of the priests or the brothers had said that if I was beaten by anyone else that God would destroy my family. So I found a clause within the contract of secrecy within these priests where I had an out. So I told my mom, pardon me for a second. I'm, uh... I spent a few days in an air conditioned hotel. So I've got this horrible cough now. Anyway, um, I told my mom that it was the teacher that had whipped me. And my mom's reaction was immediate. She, the next day, called the principal of the school, who was one of my main abusers. And she said that I was not going to be coming back there. And he had the audacity, and she didn't know anything else about what else had happened. That would be many years later that I would disclose the other things that happened to me. He had the audacity to tell her to please keep me in school till the end of the term so they could get their provincial grant money. <laughs> um, I thought at the time, just a few weeks before that had happened, um, when I had been forced to perform fellatio on that um, principal, when he was done with me, he grabbed me by the back of my neck and he threw me down the stairs. And I still have a scar on my chin to this day. And as an adult, when I you know, was going through my healing and thinking about these events that happened, I thought he was trying to kill me. And I knew that if I was to be put back in that school at the time, I, I would be probably, there would have been an accident. Um, so as that happened and I transitioned to a public school, again, I was different because I felt I, I grew up during my childhood when I needed to be playing and socializing with other children. Instead, I was carrying the secret that any, if I said anything to anyone, God would destroy my family. And as ludicrous as it sounds, it's frightening, a frightening burden as a child to, to hold on to. So I excluded myself from sports, from things that would have to involve me in, in working with other children or other people. And I became quite isolated and I buried my head into books I had a half sister who was also abused and she turned her life into drugs uh, as her way of coping with what had happened to the school. Um, I turned my life into trying to prove that I was a worthy person. So I believe the only reason I have a PhD is because it was a part of me trying to prove to others that I was worthy. 
And that's exhausting. It's mm-hmm. exhausting. And as a as a as an adult, when I was about to have children or you know get married and, and talk about having a family, I had been very secretive about my abuse. Very few people would know about it um, until I was in my mid to late 20s when I started telling people, which apparently is also very early to disclose that kind of stuff. But I knew that I was at risk if I didn't start my healing journey of getting into cyclical abuse. And that can be even just being quiet when asked how I'm doing and just simply responding with fine, not sharing my thoughts, distancing myself from my intimate relationships. Um, and those were always very hard. And it, it finally, when it finally dawned on me, and this was as an adult, and I know that God wasn't going to destroy me or my family, but it still was a very difficult thing to disclose because as a male, I felt like I was a lesser man because what had happened to me as a child. I could look back and go, why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do that? Why didn't I say something? But that's because professional pedophiles, it's all about power and how they can coerce and control. It took me a very long time to take the blame away from myself and shift it to my frustration and anger towards those who were entrusted with my care they broke the contract of taking care of a child. (laughs) And it's it's become a very important part of my life to share my story about the importance of disclosure. And for people to think, I thought forever that I was alone nobody had endured what I had endured and it's both frightening but also comforting in an odd way to know there are other survivors out there and every survivor's story is different and whether you it was one time or an almost an attempt or if it was hundreds of times it's all the same it's a shattering of trust and it's a it's a for me it felt like it was a a murdering of my soul Because as a child, it was all about God. And I had this fear of God. And this brings me into the other part, talking about the Jedi part of of my, my life. And that is when I was eight years old and just out of the private school, I had gone to a, to see Smokey and the Bandit, which is, I don't know why eight year olds would go see this film. It was a birthday or nine-year-olds it was a birthday party thing and I got invited and I was not part of this group but I was the other kid in the neighborhood and it was like smoking the bandit all about beer runs and like women in cars and I what um but I kept leaving the cinema and I noticed these two words it said star wars and I would keep going to this other thing and there was this gold robot and a trash can and there was this like big furry carpet thing that would just growl there was a princess and the smuggler guy and um but what it did this odd assortment of unlikely heroes were taking on this empire and the empire wearing black gray which is everything like the school I had attended, the priests in their black robes, the uh, the gray in the walls, the dim lighting, everything done in secrecy, but also with this authoritarian hand. Um, and to see a small band of people standing up and having hope, <laughs> hope, and knowing the odds of what it was to speak out or stand up against such a structured empire was huge. And I remember um, Princess Leia, spoilers. Um, the movie is very old, so I, I, um, spoilers. <laughs> you know, if you haven't seen it, I, I feel sorry. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, Princess Leia says to Tarkin in, in Star Wars A New Hope, she says, the more you tighten your fingers, the more innocent star systems will, or will slip through. The more you tighten your fists, the more innocent star systems will slip through your fingers. 
And that's so true. And I, there was that moment as a child that I found a, a form of religion in the Star Wars universe. So it became basically my religion, this idea of the force. It wasn't a, a man in a chair who's looking over earth, who wants you to keep secrets and will destroy you if you tell your family or your parents if you know, you've been molested or, or sexually abused or beaten. It was this idea of a life force that we all share, that we all come from, and that we all go back to, that surrounds us and binds us and brings us together, that really started to take shape and became a, a huge part of my life, which led to me, um, then I remember uh, when action figures started coming out from this movie. I was in a pharmacy with my mom and, um, this little, this is the one, this little guy here was, <laughs> was there. And I was never one to ask for stuff, but I asked my mom if I could have it. And she said, yes. And this has been with me through all my major life events because it gives me hope. It's a touchstone, it's a silly material thing. I know it's just a piece of plastic, but it's what it represents. It's that a small group of people that have had wrongs done to them can stand up against a giant empire and accept the fact that they will be called liars, that they will be called traitors, that they will be imprisoned, but their spirit says, we have to stand up against it because that's important. It's so impactful. And as I became older, it's, it's the idea of the dark side and the light side of the force. There is no light or dark in the sense is the way I view it. I view it as myself, as someone who's in the gray. I spend parts of my life in the light parts of my life in the dark. And I can only strive my entire life to find that balance. However, it's the effort of maintaining or trying to achieve the balance, which is the goal, not actually living in the light or the dark, but knowing that I must strive to find that path in between. And so as a child, something, you know, these child, ch childlike movies have become a huge part of my life. That's what gave me hope. And for the longest time, I felt alone. I felt that it had only happened to me. But gradually, when I first spoke out about it, uh, and this was before in the Catholic Church, there was a thing called Spotlight that happened in Boston. Mm -hmm. I had disclosed to a lawyer and I was asked to, uh, I, when I was in therapy, my therapist had asked me to make a, a, a report to the RCMP about what had happened. And this is a time when people were not talking about, really talking about clerical abuse. And I, she came with me to the RCMP station and they rejected, they did not want to hear it. They said, nope, you have to go to the one up in Prince George where it happened. And so I drove up to Prince George by myself, tried to do the same thing. They rejected me again. So just being freshly in therapy and dealing with, uh, coming to understand the far-reaching effects of abuse and being shut down in those two places was devastating. But again, like Star Wars, I felt I needed to continue to talk about it. And then um, the lawyer I had, nobody was talking. Everyone was keeping silent. Other survivors were too afraid to speak out because it is a very scary and frightening thing to step out of your comfort zone and say, this is what happened to me. It's easy to sit back and to listen and silently agree. And that's fine if people, if that's what they do, that's fine. But for those who step forward and who dare to, to say anything, you put yourself out there for much more abuse. Uh, and I was the target of jokes, you know, Catholic, schoolboy jokes about things 
because no one really understood how devastating this kind of trauma is on the child that's inside of us. And it was only after Spotlight came out that people really started to take it more seriously with, there was a problem within the Catholic organization. And again, I say the Catholic, but this applies to the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, it applies to the Anglican, you know, any of the Mormon, any organization where they demand an obedience to their authority from and 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 the way that they induct young people and create this pressure of us having these things done to us by representatives of god it's it's huge so it takes a lot and again as a survivor i have my good days and i have my bad days um when it came up again, when we found out that my case had not been officially dismissed and I've relitigated it, I had my wife of over 20 years. We had two children together. She said to me, and when I was writing the book, I was writing the book at the same time. And she said, I can't do this again. I said, what do you mean? She says, I can't go through this again with you. And I said, I have to get the book out. I have to honor that child. And she left. It wasn't because, she, you know, that we had, she hated me. It was that she couldn't understand how difficult it was. And again, looking back as a survivor, and again, with my children, and I look at what had happened to them over the years as well, seeing how I distance myself from my own spouse. And then again, being quiet and feeling like I had to do stuff alone. Those are times I wish I could come, come back to and say, I wish I could have had the strength then to tell her what was really affecting me during that time. But there was a part of me thinking as a male that it would not be masculine of me to do so. And that I would be a lesser man because I had to provide for my family and I had to take care of my family. And that's why I started therapy because I wanted my children to never have to experience what I experienced. But what I have taught my children in being stoic is watching them in, as they move forward with less friends themselves because dad doesn't have friends, dad doesn't have this. And they do things, they're hyper-independent as well. So that's one thing that I messed up in that sense, that I was too forgetful that my children were watching me and replicating things that I didn't think they were seeing. So eventually, as things move on, hopefully it will become less and less as the next generations come forward with that. But those are some of the effects generationally from what happened to me personally. My mom to this day, she's nearing the end of her life now. She blames herself. And it's hard for me, I keep telling her, you didn't know. And I don't hold her accountable for it because she did not know. And when she knew that something had happened to me, she removed me from the situation because she could. Had she had known what had happened before, it would. I would have been pulled out much earlier, but she didn't know because the people that were doing this are very good at keeping the children quiet in shame and fear and feeling less human than other people. So it's all good in the sense that I'm still friends with my ex, which is fine. And I understand she had to leave and I'm okay in that sense. But my message is that the more the individuals can come forward and the more I can share my story, I'm hoping that that will ignite, uh, I mentioned it earlier uh, before the meeting, ignite more sparks because those of us who've endured abuse, whether it was physical, emotional, sexual, or a combination of all of that, um, we are part of an unfortunate fraternity. And there is a comfort knowing that 
we are out there and I'm here for any of other survivors who want to speak with me or let me hear their story because we understand each other mm -hmm. and it's it's okay it's okay as a male I learned long ago it's okay to cry <laughs> and it's it's a hard thing and I feel like no less of a man for how I am today from having disclosed my my abuse but every day I still think about those events that happened to me as a child and it can come from a trigger memory of a smell or a sound or a visual image or being back in a room that something happened and I think um, it's never too late to start the healing path either. And I started a little bit early and um, it's ongoing. And, you know, that's what, you know, my book is all about that as well. And it's, it's, it's a testament about the, the human spirit. And I think we just all need to find the power of our stories and find the power within our voices because from going from a victim to a survivor is such a huge thing and i feel you I, I feel all of you and i hope that um what i've had to say is been of some insight to you perhaps is there anything else you want me to say on that i feel like <laughs> i've said so much <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Harrison. Uh, whenever you speak, I'm reminded of, let me remove this spotlight there. Um, I'm reminded of so many stories that I've listened to over the four years I've been with this project. And I'm the newest member of um, this working team. Um, so everyone, uh, Emmy, Wendy, Judy, everyone else has heard much more than I have, but I'm reminded by every story of uh, people talking about their friends, people talking about their parents and their descendants. And I can see so many similarities with your story and their stories, uh, especially in relation to power, that position mm. of power the abuser has, both in the community, uh, in your case, in a school, um, power with the church, with God, and how that can you know, coerce silence and obedience. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about your, I mean, your, your healing process with your relationship with your parents, because I know that's, that's something that has caused a lot of, I guess, secondary trauma with survivors um, that we've spoken to. Um, in the way their parents did or didn't accept their truth mm. about the abuse when it happened and how that propagates um, or propagated into how they conducted their themselves for the rest of their lives with their spouses and children. Interesting. Yes. Um, that's a very interesting point because I remember um, when I was at school, there was another boy, Vincent, whose parents were Catholic. And now we had different categories of children at the school. We had those whose parents were Catholic. They went to a Catholic private school. It was, it was systematic. And those children, you know, their, their parents believed the priests because they grew up, they were very religious. And then there were the indigenous children who were at the school and in the church's care. And in a sense, being in a residential day school, which, as we all know, the horrors that have happened there. And then there were children like me whose parents just wanted to give them better education. So Vincent, one of the, one of the, the things that they would do is, is of course, strappings. Um, Brother Leopold, one of, the, one of my main abusers, loved the strap. And he got so angry at Vincent one day, he... Um, strapped his hand so hard he broke metatarsals in his hand and when his parents found out because he, brother leopold called his parents to tell them what vincent had done and he now he had broken his hand 
um, the parents continued the beating of Vincent when he got home because he had done something so bad to make a priest do this to him. So there was this sense of loyalty to believing the priest above the child in that situation. Mm -hmm. In my situation, my parents weren't, my dad was Anglican, I guess, uh, originally. Uh, my mom was um, uh, Ukrainian, uh, Viennese, German. So she, there were like Mennonite, I guess, was the closest thing that they had there. So there was no, we never went to church. We never did that until I started going to school. So when, with her, that relationship, when I finally disclosed to her, now she immediately pulled me out of school when I was in grade four and the, the beating happened with, with one of the teachers. But when I had, I wasn't going to, I decided I was not going to tell my parents what had happened. I was like, nope, I'm not going to say anything to them. They're too old. They don't need to know. And I was working on a show at the time called Snow Falling on Cedars. Um, I was doing the, the kendo for, for the movie uh, because kendo was one of my main things I love doing. Uh, and again, ways to protect myself, right? I did all these martial arts to protect myself to never be abused again. So I remember coming home from, we were shooting in Whitby Island and I had driven home to Vancouver and my back for the very first time went out and then when i say went out like i could not stand up and it was a partly to do with the emotional um turmoil i was going through because i was in therapy at the time and disclosing with my therapist what had happened but i was keeping that secret from my parents and i remember laying on the couch and there was a, a movie playing i think it was the boys of saint vincent which was all about pedophile priests and Mothers are very insightful beings. <laughs> they are their own um, goddesses themselves because they know, they see in their children, like I'm sure everyone can relate to a mother who may not say anything, but sees everything. And I remember like I would call them every night and I was talking to them and they knew my back had gone out. And I was just in this conversation with them my mom was like, what's wrong? Out of the blue. And I was like, nothing. And she's like, what's wrong? And I was like, no, there's nothing wrong. <laughs> and I was just starting to come up. And she said, you can tell me. And I was like, no, no, I can't. And things started to unravel because I was like, I cannot tell them this. This is like, because it went right back to that child going, if I tell them, God will destroy us. This is going to happen. I mean, I knew that wasn't going to happen, but it was that, it, it felt very intense. And then my mom, it was, it was very, in a very funny, it was funny. Well, later on, it was funny. She was like, are you gay? And it was like, what? I'm like, no. Um, but she knew something was, was wrong. And then finally, I just said to them that I had been abused. And there was a pause. And she said, I thought so. And then she said, um, I'm so sorry. I said, it's not your fault. And since that day, my mom and my dad blamed themselves for not seeing it. And of course there were signs when I was a child trying to find ways to tell them without telling them that they didn't pick up on those signals. And, you know, that's what's really hard for me this day and my mom in her eighties, um, still blaming herself and going, I am such a bad person. I'm like, no, you're not, you're not. Um, because had she known, they would have done something. And my dad, when I went into discovery, because he was a um, he was a paratrooper during the Second World War, and he was driving me to my discovery. And he was a very peace, very quiet guy. He never really talked any, at all about what happened in, in the war. And he actually said to me when he dropped me off my second day, he said, I really wish you had told me when when you were uh, a kid. And I said, well, you know, I said, I know, I know you, could, you couldn't have. He said, but I would have been out of jail by now. I was like, whoa. Um, so I was lucky in that my parents immediately understood and believed me. But I have other friends who, whose parents cut them off and decided it was better to take the side of the church over their own children. So everyone's different. Um, 
however, in talking to them, they've said to me, I tell them again, because it takes that weight off the shoulders. Because this, this secret is now no longer a secret. And it's on the table for people to decide whether or not they accept it and they process it and start working with it or whether they reject it. And if people reject it, it might be a rejection now. It doesn't mean it's a rejection for the rest of their life. It could be a week, it could be a month, it could be years. They might go back and say, I'm ready to talk to you about it. Because if they truly didn't know what was happening, it can be a huge shock. Um, but I think in my case, because my parents weren't religious, they were um, much more um, embracing of me finally disclosing. But it's a huge thing. And I know some people have taken it to the grave, you know, and I know other people who have ended, you know, um, their lives because they didn't want people to know. And that's what's really sad because I think we all have a lot to offer. And I think that in clearing these energies of the secrecy and the shame and the guilt, um, which prevents us from fully experiencing life, um, that's what's really sad. And that's the thing that upsets me about the legacy of abuse, even if it happened once as a child, how even one time can set the course and change the course of a child's life for the rest of their life into loneliness and to desperation and to feeling unloved. And that's what I think is the most um, tragic thing about uh, hiding and holding on to it and feeling that people aren't gonna believe you. And that's tough because people won't believe you, but finding that strength to get beyond caring what other people think and speaking the truth, I think is what's really, really important. And it takes a lot and it's, it takes time. It, it, it takes time. It doesn't happen immediately, but the small steps, little steps are amazing journeys. So even if it's a small step, that's great. Um, Peter, I'd, I'd like to, uh, it's Judy Hanazawa, and I'd like to sort of uh, give some feedback to this and, what I'd like to say first to Nick is um, you're an incredible person for how much you put on the line and how much of yourself you let be open because you're so intent on, on the well-being of everybody. And uh, I just thank you so much for what you've given because, and, and you are so honest because as you say how much it affects you, we're witnessing how much it affects you. So I, I totally want to say thank you for that. Um, I think for, for our uh, attendance here, um, maybe the question exists of, you know, hearing about your experience as a child and your experience as somebody who's been violated by clergy. Um, the, the thinking might be, how, how, what are the parallels here in the Japanese Canadian community with Dr. Mr. Nakayama? Mm. And yes, and for sure, um, the matter of um, the, the survivors being mostly male boys, uh, teenagers, uh, and their thoughts, as you did, about um, wanting to be stoic, um, having situations, as Peter referred to, which was... Um, that uh, they, they told their moms, in some cases we know they told their moms and the moms got angry with them. Those are the things, scenarios that you've also referred to. Mm -hmm. um, and then also um, the added thing, which was um, we don't want our boys, we don't want our children to be harmed, so keep them away. We don't want anything to do with Mr. Nakayama. But at the same time, we do not want the matter of what he did to these children known by the public, right. known outside the Japanese community or even within the community because it taints the community. And there's enough racism, there's enough hate, uh, there's enough othering going on against Japanese Canadians, which, which who were uh, violated by the state, uh, uh, you know, so that the added, the added burden of having a pedophile in the community abusing the children in the community was something that 
the community wrestled with as something that they could not let be known. So there was this other level of secrecy going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, but but I guess what I, I, I wanted to sort of maybe convey here is is that uh, what you're ending up with, which is, you know, steps are there. Um, openness uh, and secrecy is is something that that counteracts everything because it it gets in the way of healing. Yeah. And I think I think this is a thing that's happening at this point now, in various ways. You know, I know the working group and the Anglican Healing Fund is really looking at this as being something that needs to be opened up now without without that extra burden that the community has felt about mm -hmm. the the the, uh, the back backlash the backlash of hate or yeah. rejection uh, so so these things are, are are something that we're dealing with in this community now about mr nakayama um, uh, and i guess i wanted to just uh, you know give a little bit of reference to something that really means a lot to me personally and that is that we've talked to seniors We've, we've had disclosures, Wendy and I, as we've crossed Canada. We've had that situation of somebody who said, I am not going to get married. I am not going to be somebody who's going to have the regular things in life because of what happened to me. Um, but I'll be okay. I'll be okay. I've just decided that for myself. And that, and that burden, Wendy and I, it was very painful to hear that. Mm. The, the, other, the other thing is... Um, is is uh, the the matter of, um, of of the angry families that that were told that were angry at the church that said we told you twenty years ago and you did nothing, so so these the, these are various things in our community that I'd like people to be aware of, um, and also the matter of 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 many people I think the the the, the Nisei men in our community who said. I was so mad. I was I was beyond I was beyond furious with what he did to me. But I decided similar to you. I decided that I'm going to have a good family. I'm going to be a good dad. And and I'm I'm going to just give my family what I want to give them because I'm going to separate this anger that I feel about what he did to me. And we and I, I guess I want to add to this that I'm saying is that these people, many of them have now passed, many of them. Wendy and I met with somebody who is now gone. And he said the matter about, and he showed us his house. He said, look at, this is my family. This is a portrait of my family on the wall. Don't they look good? And we said, mm. yes, they certainly do. And he said, well, I'm going to keep my anger away from them, he said. Yeah. So yeah. So what I'm why I'm saying this is because it is something for the community to deal with as as we're doing and with your help, being so graphic about the experience and giving of yourself so deeply. It's so it's so appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, but at this point now, I guess I want to just end this by by saying that we 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 are doing something here. We are doing what you're saying. We're taking a step. And uh, definitely yes, and and I just I just want to say how grateful I am. Thank you. Thank I, you. I'm I'm thank you. I'm very grateful to be speaking with the group today. Um, and as you said too, um, the internment camps, the families that were torn apart, and the men taken away, and the mothers left to care for their children, oftentimes in the camp after having their homes removed, their lives upended, and to have to be a strong mother for their children. And then the one, you know, a godlike person comes in and can be celebrated, oh my gosh, and tell them news of the other camps and family members who might be in other camps. There's a level of trust there that was so violated. And so under that kind of a trauma as well with, you know, people trying to hold on or form a, I hate to use the expression, but like a new normal within the camp of like, we will try to create a community again. And it, it, there's a lot, you know, and 
it letting like a fox into these chicken coops, basically being able to assess who and how he's going to act. It's, it's horrific. And there's an automatic trust that comes when someone who can move as freely between camps. And we automatically in society to this day, we do it still with police. We do it, you know, and there's a lot of bad police out there. There's good police, there's bad police. There's good priests, there's bad priests. And unfortunately, the pedophiles hide within the fabric of what is good. And not to say that maybe um, a priest could have been an excellent priest, but there's that public face and then there's the true person within. So it's the actions that speak louder than the words. And anyone can come in and, and you know, it's the charisma of a priest as well. And, and people trying to put their lives and survive together. And then to be further having that happen to the children. It's, it's unimaginable. It's like, it's, it's horrific. It's, it's unfathomable. And my heart goes out to all the survivors and their families because there are times I wanted to tell my children and sometimes the way I overreacted to protect my children and didn't explain to them why I had overreacted to protect them. And it was a knee jerk reaction because it was the child in me trying to make up for um, when I wasn't protected. And then my kids thought, well, that was a little bit, you know, dad was a little bit uh, harsh then. And it wasn't because I was trying to be mean, it was because I wanted to protect them, but I did it in a way that I overcompensated. But I didn't want to tell them why or explain what happened to dad and this is why I was protecting you from this, you know? So it's, it's very, very um, complex mm -hmm. how we all heal and the experiences that lead up to the events of the abuse as well. And when you add the trauma of going into a camp and having your lives ripped away from you and trying to once again, start over, I mean, oh my gosh. My heart goes out to you for that too. It's just sad. <laughs> Thank you. So, no, I, I think that was that was an amazing point when you were speaking about overreacting and what that must have been like for your children. Um, and that's something we're dealing with as part of the healing fund. Is not. It's the difficulty of addressing this topic in the community when there's been so much secrecy and the ways that um, parents or grandparents can exhibit, you know, it, it, it's how trauma manifests itself in, in its varied ways that we're trying to address and we're trying to reach out to the community um, to educate everybody on what the outcomes could be and, and what they have been for for hundreds of members of our community uh, stemming from the abuse of Mr. Nakayama. Um, and I have heard recently from a member of the community um, that they will refuse to come forward personally, but they are overjoyed that the truth is finally out in the community and that people know about this, in their words, about this evil man who took all this evil with him to his grave. Yeah. Um, so even if members of the community aren't aware or um, are reticent to coming forward, we're going to keep pushing this project forward and we'll be open until 2026 at the very least, September 2026, um, ready to receive anybody who, who is able to come forward. And if you can't, we're gonna do our best um, to provide resources accessible to all anonymously on our website uh, so people can approach healing at their own pace and in their own way. In, in their own way. With that, I'd like to thank Dr. Harrison again for speaking. Um, thank you, Judy, for your question. At this point, I'll, I'll end the recording and then I'll open the floor to public um, questions.